Hey, what's up guys, I'm Josh. This was sent out for review. No one is paying or asking me to say anything good or bad. All thoughts and opinions are of course my own. This is the EF600 and let's talk about it because I have a lot to say. So one, this is an all-in-one DAC amplifier to begin with. Not only that, but it features an R2R DAC inside of it, and it's all encompassed in this sort of headphone stand device. And I think a lot of people are gonna ask if you can just do something like this. Yeah, of course you can, but I think that there's something nice about having an all-in-one device. And I think that's who Hyphman is going to be marketing towards, obviously. Now there's a couple kinks that I wish they would work out in future generations, but let's go ahead and talk about the general build right now, because this thing is monolithic. This thing is like an obelisk. It's weird. It's uh, very strange. It definitely sticks out in a desk setup uh, and it looks quite clean, but not everybody is going to like the ultra clean kind of interface that they're going with here. I do wish some of the quality and quality control of this product was a little bit better if I'm being honest here. The general construction is actually fairly good. You have this aluminum faceplate and kind of these plastic sides. And this plastic allows us to have this very rounded contoured headpiece and a slightly concaved side piece for the headphone pads to sit on. So I actually don't have a problem with that portion. The portion that I have a problem with is mainly in the interface. So this is an $800 DAC amplifier. As far as I'm concerned, that's entering the high-end realm. That's an expensive device and you'd want it to feel expensive. And some of the interface things here just don't feel that great. The buttons feel kind of cheap. You can even hear kind of how cheap they sound. And then the volume dial one, the potentiometer inside here isn't the best. Um, there's also physical problems with it, but it's got a little bit of play to the volume dial. So I do wish that was a little bit better. I think some quality control here would be a hugely beneficial. So on the front, you have a switch for your four different gain settings, which is gonna be two gain settings, high and low for both OS and NOS. Then your other switch is going to be your USB selection, your RCA selection, your XLR selection, or your Bluetooth selection. And yes, this does have Bluetooth. Let's take a look at the back. In the back, you do have this Bluetooth dongle, as well as two USB inputs. And yes, that is USB-C, and yes, it does work. Thank you, Hyphman and your coaxial inputs, and then your array of XLR and RCA inputs and outputs. Now on the back, you also have your only power on and off switch. So this thing does stay on unless you reach all the way behind it and turn it off. This thing actually seems to generate a lot of heat. Not only do they have heat vents all along the entire bottom here, but also along the two very top pieces here as well. And on top of that, it actually heats up the pads of the headphone quite a, a bit. Uh, here in the summer months, I hate this. In the winter months, I'll probably love this. Inside, they have their Himalayan Pro R2R DAC, which has garnered a lot of fans over the years since it came out. And then the amplifier in this is a little bit weird because they don't really go into detail as to what exactly it is. So if you do know, please link it in the comment section down below. I couldn't actually find uh, what amplifier reliably uh, that uh, it is. So I, I am curious if anybody actually knows which amplifier this is because uh, they don't seem to say on the website. But this will output five watts into 32 ohms and 1.8 watts into 32 ohms out of the single-ended output. The specifications are fairly decent, though not the best for total harmonic distortion or signal to noise ratio. Uh, THD is, I think, 0 0.0018, and the uh, signal to noise ratio is 118 dB, if I remember correctly. Also note on the XLR outputs on the back, these are line outs. They are not volume controlled, and they do not auto mute when you plug in a headphone, unfortunately. Given that this is an expensive product, I would either like to have the option or to have an auto switch or just a at least a mute for the back. That way you could hook this up to monitors and headphones, but not have to play them both. So for all-in-ones right now, this is actually kind of a like a dumb all-in-one. It doesn't really do a whole lot. It doesn't have a whole lot of functionality for the money. Something like this, which is a few R7, you get power, better technical specifications, and uh, a lot more functionality out of this. This is also a streamer, but it's got smart things that aren't uh, easy to ignore, like it's got a selectable difference between pre-out and line-out for uh, the outputs in the back. Just small, simple things amongst many other things that this does makes this a very smart amplifier, makes this a very capable amplifier in ways that this isn't. It just doesn't have the same function as the EF600. So 
So I've used primarily the new Aria Organic. This leads me into an interesting discussion that might make up another video, but the interesting thing here is that this amplifier offers way more power than almost every single Heifman except for one needs. Uh, now one is Susfaro, which is also a legacy design at this point. They're not really coming out with new super updated Susfaros in the way that a lot of not only Heifmans are going, but most high-end headphones are going, they're becoming more and more efficient. And this means that this amplifier is way overkill for what most of Heifman has to offer, except for a couple legacy designs like the Susfara or like the HE6, for example. So you are gonna be spending most of your time out of the balanced output in low gain on the lower half of the volume dial. And this is true for any of the other super powerful amplifiers like that A90D I just brought out, for example. Now that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, it's just an observation here, is that a lot of what Heifman has right now are headphones that are just getting more efficient, and uh, that's kind of a good thing. So as a compliment to this thing, this thing has way more power than most people are going to need. Unfortunately, for a certain category, like IEMs, this actually has too much power and not enough modulation in terms of volume output, for things like IEMs. So it seems like where this amplifier starts on the low end, which is actually something that I don't feel like is discussed enough for amplifiers, but it's sort of not really relevant to most people, but any IEM user I think will not be happy with this thing. You have to regulate the volume on your source because you need to turn it down enough to get further up into the volume than that first like 10% of turning it because the first 10% of turning it, there's actually a very noticeable uh, channel imbalance. And this is a common thing amongst a lot of amplifiers, especially those that use real potentiometers. So it's not a huge knock on this. Um, and it's just like that very first bit of a turn, but that's actually where this amplifier starts playing IEMs and it gets really loud really quick, even on low gain out of the single ended output. So the sonic barrier to entry for sound is actually quite high on this. So I'm gonna say IEM users, unless you can really turn down your source, this is a no-go. And honestly, given today's current market for amplifiers and DACs, I kind of think this is an unacceptable thing uh, for them to be doing, is like not playable at all with IEMs currently. And I do think that this is weird because they're actually coming out with their own high-end IEMs and it's not playable with their like most marketed amplifier right now is wild. So for how this actually sounds, it actually has some characteristics that I think some users will like and some characteristics that I don't think they will like. And I think that people are gonna be split either way. This is a relatively smooth but detailed sounding amplifier. It's not smooth in the sense that tubes would deliver the, a, a kind of an ultra smooth experience. A uh, very lush, milky experience is what you would get with you know something like a Wu Audio amplifier in the tube realm. This is sort of on the softer side of kind of a lot of the modern amps that seem to be very sharpened these days. Things like the THX line of amplifiers, even things like the NFCA amps from Topping. Uh, if you listen to those and you think that they're maybe too sterile, if you think that they're maybe too detailed or too analytical, something like this is a, a bit of a step down without completely taking a giant leap into a completely different sound signature. And it does have one notable characteristic that I think would kind of split the audience here. It does have a bit of a roll off in the ultra high end. So if you're listening to things above like 12, 13, 14, 15,000 Hertz, it does start to slope off a little bit. And there's things on other amplifiers that I can straight up hear easily that are inaudible on this amplifier. And that's mostly notable in those finite little details that are deep into the track. Obviously when you're playing something like strings that's hitting up there in a very noticeable way, they pop through, but it's more of the subtle things like the, the deep seated background noise on a recording, like a little bit of a whine that they might've missed in their mastering. Uh, things like that seem to disappear a little bit more and aren't as obvious on this amplifier. Now, unfortunately on this, I'm not sure if this is a result of the DAC stage or the amplifier stage. I think experienced listeners are gonna have a preference between NOS and OS. I, I don't think that that's something that necessarily like a day one audiophile would pick up on the differences. It's quite subtle. I, I think most people settle on the NOS. It seems to be just a hair more like vibrant and alive, a little bit more saturated sounding but uh, the significance of that change is actually quite minimal here. Not to say non-existent, just minimal. Um, I think the rest of it though, relatively hits pretty squarely in what we know solid states for. Solid bass response, really low noise floor, 
uh, high dynamic range, 118 dB. While that's not the best out there today, it's still very, very good. Some of the legacy R2R decks really threw a lot of distortion into uh, the system. And this one doesn't seem to quite be doing that as much as I was anticipating. Um, again, maybe a good thing for you, maybe a bad thing. But compared to like an ESS deck, for example, this is relatively on the same spectrum for sound. It's it's fairly straightforward, I think. So my conclusion is a little bit complicated. While objectively, I can recognize that this doesn't have the specifications or capability that I would expect for this money, I also realize that it's a niche product and niche products bring a certain utility to certain people. And that can really create a value in certain things that may not be objective performance, like subjectivity of the R2R DAC, for example, or subjectivity of having this all-in-one device that also holds your headphone. Like having a streamlined all-in-one that can hold your headphone might be more valuable than a few percent on total harmonic distortion or having a few more input options or more volume control capability on IEMs. So I end up giving the same recommendation for niche products that aren't absolute shit, which is if it fits your circumstances, you're going to know it. And I think for people who like that circumstance, this is a great amplifier for you. I think that the performance, while maybe not dollar for dollar the best, is certainly good enough for most people. I think objectivists obviously are going to be looking towards things like your toppings, maybe things like your FIO, which are a little bit cleaner for sound quality and um, uh, do a little bit more functionally, but don't offer the same utility as the EF600.